like to start asking about the chapter two of your book, Imperial Grand Strategy, because it is very important for us in Latin America to realize uh, all the complexity of this strategy and that we are not in presence of punctual interventions, but this uh, obeys to a great design of imperial policy. What could you tell us about this? Well, first I should say that the phrase imperial grand strategy is an interesting one. It's not mine. It's uh, borrowed from a well-known, quite conservative international relations specialist writing in Foreign Affairs, which is the main establishment journal. And this was the immediate reaction within weeks to uh, the announcement, the declaration in September 2002 of uh, the Bush administration's national security strategy, uh, which uh, aroused uh, a, a great uh, fear and concern around the world, but also within the foreign policy elite within the United States. We was pointing out that uh, the imperial, what he calls the new imperial grand strategy announced by the Bush administration uh, is uh, uh, he, he discusses its dangers. He thinks, and as many do, many conservative analysts, that it's a, an enormous danger to the world and to the interests of the United States as well. This kind of reaction was quite common across a large sector of elite opinion. In fact, Foreign Affairs had other articles in the coming months uh, warning against the war in Iraq. Everyone warning against the war. Yeah, because which everyone understood to be just an illustration, kind of an exemplary action to demonstrate that the imperial grand strategy is meant very seriously. We will attack anyone we feel like without any pretext or uh, uh, just because we have the power to do it. Uh, the, uh, the other foreign, there's a second foreign policy journal called Foreign Policy, uh, also had uh, uh, articles expressing severe criticism and reservations. This is quite unusual. I mean, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, you know, the major, uh, most respectable, uh, old, the back to revolutionary times uh, organization of intellectuals, uh, did something which I think they've never done before. They published a monograph uh, on called, I think, called War on Iraq, uh, uh, giving as sympathetic an account as they could of the Bush administration imperial grand strategy and the war, but then in a very cautious and muted way, giving a rather, rather harsh criticism of it. on uh, current international issues. Uh, actually, the same was true elsewhere when uh, at the World Economic Forum, which in uh, Davos, uh, Switzerland in uh, January, last January, uh, which is the gathering of uh, the people who basically own the world. In fact, the, the business press calls them uh, the masters of the universe with only a little bit of irony. Uh, th they were extremely hostile. Uh, Colin Powell was sent by the administration as an emissary to convince them to join in the war effort, and uh, he, he was barely able to speak. The atmosphere was extremely hostile. And, and, and so this, as I say, it's not my phrase. It's a phrase that's used in conservative establishment circles out of concern for the implications of the strategy. Now, we have to be a little cautious about this because they really don't object to the strategy. And in fact, it has roots going back um, 60 years or 70 years. In fact, uh, before at the early stages of the Second World War, before the United States had even entered the war, uh, there were uh, high-level 
planning groups of the State Department and the Council on Foreign Relations uh, beginning to lay plans for <coughs> the post-war world, mm -hmm. which they assumed the United States would have a very influential position. I mean, up until the Second World War, the United States had been by far the largest economy in the world. In fact, a century ago, it was the largest economy. But it was not a major actor on the world scene. It was in the region, so Central America and the Caribbean, and as far as Venezuela, uh, Woodrow Wilson kicked the British out of Venezuela in 1920 because he wanted the oil. But uh, that's and a little bit in the Pacific. It wasn't like Britain or France. However, it was understood that after the Second World War that would change and the United States would be a world dominant power, the world dominant power. So they laid plans and among them were plans which when you read them, I quote some of them in the book, are not very different from the Bush administration imperial grand strategy. I mean, they spoke about the need for uh, the United States to be a world dominant power to prevent exercise of sovereignty by other powers who might interfere with U.S. designs and uh, recognize that to do this would require a major uh, uh, military force uh, permanently. But the point is, it's, 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 uh, it's not brazenly declared as a, an announcement to the world that we are going to control you by force. It's quiet diplomacy or internal planning. It's not meant for people to see outside of uh, small circles. And uh, I mean, unless you read uh, you know, the classified records, or you don't read it in the newspapers or the journals yeah, and so on. Not. The Bush administration is not out of the spectrum of planning, but it's at a very extreme end. Uh, in fact, there's this interesting follow-up articles, again, in Foreign Affairs, which gives a, the journal of Foreign Affairs, which gives a good picture of mainstream establishment thinking. But in the post-war issues, there are articles by people like Madeleine Albright, you know, Secretary of State under Clinton, who says, Look, the, the, the basic ideas, she says, are correct, but you don't declare them like that. You keep them quiet, and you only use them when you have to. You, know, you don't want to antagonize the whole world and turn the world into uh, people who are frightened and uh, defensive. And others pointed out quite correctly, and the administration knows this, which is interesting. It was very widely predicted by intelligence agencies, uh, foreign policy analysts, that, these, that the imperial grand strategy and the war, which was intended to exemplify it, would increase proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, would increase the risk of terror, uh, and uh, would in fact uh, cause enormous dangers. If this is true, which I fully agree with you, well, what is the novelty brought about by the Bush administration? Perhaps that they say what other things and didn't say, not only or that they are doing things which well, other didn't they are doing? it's both. Both. Once you declare it publicly, instead of keeping it sort of in your pocket in case you need it, you know, when you declare publicly, we are going to dominate the world by force if necessary. We are going to prevent any potential challenge to our domination. Uh, we, we will act without any concern for international law or the United Nations. In fact, if you read the national security strategy, there's barely a mention of international law in the United Nations. And the actions of the administration illustrate that they have utter contempt for international institutions. They want to destroy them. International law doesn't matter. Uh, the U.S. will simply be uh, what we should call a rogue state, a powerful rogue state which will do what it wants. And if you don't like it, too bad for you. Uh, the, uh, uh, so it's first of all the, the brazen announcement of this, but then the implementation of it. I mean, there were a number of reasons for invading Iraq, but one reason, it was widely recognized, I think correctly, that one reason was just to illustrate that when we say we are going to attack anyone we want without a pretext, we'll do it. <laughs>
and we don't care what you think. So it was, uh, you, you recall that right after the strategy was announced, the uh, Bush administration, including Colin Powell, the so-called moderate, uh, informed the Security Council very clearly that you can, as they put it, be relevant and endorse what we're going to do anyway. So you can put your meaningless stamp of approval on it if you want, or else uh, you can be a debating society. Uh, you can talk to each other, but we're going to go ahead anyhow. coming back to the UN in a, in a very humble position because almost begging for the UN to come in. How, how do you see this? Well, this uh, one of the, again, from conservative sectors, they were being warned that their arrogance uh, and uh, uh, brazen contempt for the world were going to get them into a lot of trouble. I mean, violence is a very good means of intimidation, but it doesn't intimidate everyone. You know, there are other powerful forces around, there's people around, and they react in their own ways. Uh, amazingly, in fact, I'm extremely surprised, they have failed to carry out a successful military occupation in Iraq, which is um, remarkable. If you look at historical analogs, uh, military occupations have been quite successful under far more difficult conditions. I mean, even the worst monsters, I mean, take, say, the Nazis. They conquered Europe. This is the most vicious regime in the world. But they had no trouble running it. Uh, I mean, Europe was run by collaborators. The, the political collaborators, uh, the military, the police and the security forces were collaborators. I mean, the Nazis are in the background. If anything went wrong, they'd step in. But for the most part, it was successful, and they were under attack. You know, after all, they were under attack mainly by the Russians at the fighting huge war with the Russians, uh, but also being attacked by Britain and the United States. And uh, the, the resistance in Europe was very courageous, but they would have crushed the resistance if it hadn't had outside support. And it had enormous outside support. Well, there's nothing like that in Iraq. I mean, they're moving into a country which was absolutely devastated by sanctions. Yeah, before I mean, the war. Before the war. Yeah, really before. And it's interesting that in the United States, you virtually cannot talk about this. So if you read the press and the journals and so on, they say the country was in bad shape, but because of Saddam Hussein, now, you know, anyone who's looked at the record, and there's a rich record, knows the country was in horrible shape because of the extremely cruel and brutal uh, U.S. sanctions. I mean, they technically through the U.N., but everyone knows the U.N. would never have implemented them, at least in this form, if it wasn't for U.S. pressure. So it had devastated the civilian society. It had actually strengthened the tyrant, made the population more very dependent on him for survival. It's one of the reasons he wasn't overthrown, I, I think. Uh, so the country was devastated. It was almost totally disarmed. Uh, it it uh, was under heavy surveillance by the U.S. Uh, it was being regularly bombed for years by the U.S. and Britain. I mean, you know, the country was a complete wreck. Uh, here the United States moves in. It ends the sanctions. It gets rid of a murderous tyrant who the U.S. had, in fact, supported, but 
didn't want him now. So it gets rid of a tyrant, ends the sanctions, no outside support for the resistance to speak of. How come they can't, I mean, it's just a perfect situation for a military occupation to come in, uh, find collaborators, run the country, reconstruct it. Uh, everybody should be pleased. But, but they failed. Why? Which is astonishing. Is there any, any hypothesis about this uh, monumental failure? Because it's a monumental failure. Because, as you say, it is quite interesting. Because the Nazis occupied all Europe. And no they, problem. They, they run the country. No, no problem. And they, w w w or take, say, take, say, the Russians in Eastern Europe. Yes. I mean, they weren't popular. Yes. But they, who ran Poland? Who ran Czechoslovakia? Yeah. I mean, the, the people in the country who, if they got out of control, the Russians might move in. But, uh, or, or say the United States and Central America, you know, it's just sort of the same story. You get collaborators to do it for you. If they don't do it properly, maybe you move in. But it, the United States and Iraq has failed. Well, why? why? Well, Have you know, any hypothesis on that? Or? I do, actually, a few, I can't. Maybe a a really couple of weeks ago. Well, a, a few or? weeks ago, I happened to be speaking to uh, someone I can't identify. He's a high official of a leading NGO, you know, uh, uh, and who has been in Baghdad since the, since since the war. war, trying to reorganize uh, health services, uh, educational services. Uh, he has a, a lot of experience all over the world, and his organization has more experience than anyone. He told me he's never seen anything like it. His phrase was uh, uh, arrogance, ignorance, and incompetence. Three arrogance, ignorance, and incompetence, uh, uh, and and that's the kind of critique they've been getting from inside. I mean, the U.S. military was bitterly critical of the civilians in the Pentagon, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, and the rest. Uh, the military said, "You just don't understand what you're doing." You know, uh, these people are extremely arrogant. They know they have enormous power in principle. They don't have, you know, they, they feel they can run roughshod over everything, they don't care, so they'll just move in, uh, everybody will do what they're told, and that's the end of it. Uh, the soldiers who were there are basically untrained, they don't know what they're there for, uh, they don't know how to deal with the population, they, you know, they have neither experience nor training with dealing with an occupied population, they're not purposely, but just by the way they behave, they're antagonizing people. Uh, when people are antagonized, they react, but that leads to more conflict. Uh, the um, civilian administrators uh, didn't give a thought to how to run the country. In fact, just to illustrate, uh, the, uh, in early May, so this is after the war, uh, when Paul Bremer, the new civilian administrator, came in, uh, the New York Times published a, uh, an organization chart it's very illuminating, I mentioned it there. Uh, the organization chart uh, of how to run Iraq. Uh, and it's like a corporate organization chart, you know, boxes and lines and this sort of thing. Who, who controls who and who answers to who. I think it had uh, 16 boxes. Uh, the top is Paul Bremer answering to the Pentagon. And then there are various lines going down and uh, each box has in it a name in bold face and a description of the person, of the yeah. function. And it's generals and diplomats and all either American or British or mostly American generals and so on. And then at the very bottom of the chart, there's a little box which has no name and no function and no bold face, half the size of the others. It says Iraqi government advisors. <laughs> now, you know, yeah, that's the picture of how you run the world. Well, you know, uh, uh, maybe you can run an ant colony that way, but not uh, human society. You know? And uh, they, uh, their sense of uh, arrogance and power and ignorance uh, is so enormous that they make horrible mistakes. And so, I mean, this is not new either. I mean, take, uh, say, Henry Kissinger. I mean, his ignorance of world affairs was startling, and it led to horrible mistakes from his own point of view. But these people are, and there was plenty of arrogance there too, uh, but nevertheless, this is extreme. It's not, I, I don't want to suggest it's unique, and in fact, it's important that it isn't unique. These are institutional facts that are deeply rooted 
and show up in many different ways. Uh, Latin Americans don't have to be told that, they're familiar with it. Uh, and, uh, uh, but in this case, it happens to be an extremely extreme, uh, extreme example. I mean, everything I've just said has been unreported. Unreported by the press. Well, you know, you can find a, occasional mention here and there. So, I mean, if, if you read the elite press, you know, Washington Post, and you really read it carefully, you'll find some reference to it. But, um, for, for example, the, uh, the Bush administration stand last October uh, at the UN uh, blocking uh, an effort to ban militarization of space and uh, they also blocked an effort to reaffirm a 1925 protocol banning bacteriological warfare. That was banned. That wasn't reported anywhere. Uh, and uh, most of what I've just described, almost no one knows about unless you, you know, have a special interest in the topic. It's not secret material. It's all public. You know? But it does not, I'm sure if there was a poll in the public, you wouldn't find one person in a hundred thousand has ever heard of it, you know. Uh, uh, so how does the public react? Well, they can't, you know, they don't know. You, know? you mentioned something very interesting in our conversation yesterday regarding the misperception and misinformation, mm -hmm. uh, which is intentionally uh, created by the press. Can you give yes, a yeah. very rapid... Right. Yeah. Well, there, I was referring to a study that just appeared, was just released by the major public opinion uh, analysis organization actually in the world. It's a very serious one, an academic uh, polling institution program on international policy attitudes. They re released a document called Misperceptions of Iraq. And uh, the misperceptions were uncontroversial matters, you know, cases where the CIA would say it's a misperception, you know, so they weren't trying to be controversial. Uh, and they uh, polled people um, to see did they have these misperceptions. So do you think that the world supported the invasion? Or do you think that uh, Saddam Hussein is uh, working with Al-Qaeda, you know, things like that? And the misperception level was extremely high. Extremely high, right? Extremely high. I mean, nobody's done it in other countries, but I'm sure that you would find almost nothing like the, almost no beliefs like that in other countries. And then they went further and uh, traced correlated misperceptions with news sources. Well, you know, it turns out that I think over 20% of the population gets their information from uh, radio and, uh, na and uh, commercial television. Well, if you listen to the radio in the United States, I mean, it's, you know, it's literally raving maniacs half the time. The radio has been bought up by right-wing foundations uh, who offer advertising to small uh, you know, companies if they are willing to run talk shows, so-called, uh, led by people who are just off the spectrum. I mean, they're so extreme that uh, you hardly publish an article in a newspaper. That's 20% uh, of the, and the public uh, co commercial television has essentially nothing. So that's the main one. Then they, uh, if you look at the rest, there's one, ultra-right television channel, Fox News. And people were watching Fox News, which probably is most of the population. Uh, about 80% of them had at least one serious misperception, usually more. 80%? If, 
And if you look at people who are getting their information from the print media, newspapers, uh, journals, there's about 50% serious misperceptions. If you go to uh, the lowest was uh, the National Public Radio and Television, the public ones, semi-public ones, which are more oriented towards an elite educated audience. And even there, it was about 25% serious misperceptions of a kind which I'm sure you would not find almost anywhere in Europe or Latin America. And the misperceptions were highly correlated with support for the war, which is quite reasonable. Now, when did all of this come? Well, you know, it came, you can trace it. It began pretty much in September 2002, the same time that they announced the national security strategy they essentially announced the planned invasion of Iraq. And they also started a huge propaganda campaign, which was conveyed by the media you know, pretty uncritically. I mean, sometimes there'd be a hesitance. And you just check the polls. And you see, as this campaign began, the fears uh, exploded. I mean, within a few weeks, a majority of the population in the United States considered Iraq a threat to the security of the United States. Now, you know, I mean, even in Kuwait, they didn't regard Iraq as a threat to the security of Kuwait. I mean, they knew it's the, they hated them, but they knew it's the weakest country in the region that barely holds together. I mean, I'm sure there was no other country in the world where anyone thought Iraq was a threat, you know, horrible maybe, a terrible monster, but not a threat. But in the United States, it was a majority. And then something quite interesting happened, which shows you how a well-disciplined propaganda system works. A few weeks later, Congress passed an, uh, a resolution authorizing the president to use force against Iraq because of the threat to the security of the United States posed by the government of Iraq. Well, two comments. First of all, that's outlandish. But second comment is that no one pointed out that they were simply copying uh, a declaration of national emergency by Ronald Reagan in 1985 when he declared a national emergency in the United States because of the unusual and extraordinary threat, those are the words, unusual and extraordinary threat to the security of the United States posed by Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Yeah, two days driving time from Texas. You know, uh, and then he went on to make speeches about how he knows the terrible difficulties facing, but he remembers a man named Winston Churchill who stood up against the Nazis and he's going to be courageous and no matter how terrible the odds, he's going to defend us from the threat of the Sandinistas, you know, marching into Texas tomorrow. Uh, did people laugh? No. And if you begin to pay attention to this, you understand what's happening in the country. I mean, the people who are now running the government are pretty much the same ones who ran it from 1981 to 1992. And they are using this, they're following the same script. Uh, did they, did they re recall this last October? Not one word, you know. There was no mention of it in the press or in the intellectual journals, journals of opinion. I mean, this is out of people's minds. Uh, no one knows it. No one knows that the United States was condemned by the World Court and by the Security Council, except that the U.S., of course, vetoed the resolution, uh, for its terrorist war, ordered they to stop, pays huge reparations. They, they, uh, never, they didn't even answer. The, the they didn't even answer. I mean, they, uh, and it's, it's gone. Uh, it's out of history. Uh, and it's worse, you know, it gets worse. Uh, on, uh, which, and it shows you how they can have some hope of running the country under these conditions when they're really harming and threatening the population. Uh, on May 1st, uh, you remember uh, this May 1st, uh, there was a very carefully staged uh, extravaganza where they had the president land uh, in combat gear on an aircraft carrier. Yeah, it was carefully placed so you get the right television images. I mean, it, it was, it's just shamed the country, you know, it's, except that it was treated like a great occasion inside. I mean, outside it was regarded either with fear or ridicule, you know. Uh, but Bush landed there and gave his victory speech. My fellow Americans, 
Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. The fear of crime is far greater. Uh, same with drugs. You know, drugs elsewhere are some kind of problem. In the United States, fear of drugs is enormous. And those things combine to uh, carry out something which has a certain analogy to social cleansing in Latin America. You, know, you send out the security forces to get rid of the undesirables by murdering them or something. Uh, in the United States, it's more civilized. You don't murder them, you put them in jail. And the undesirables are overwhelmingly black, black males, uh, secondarily Latinos, a um, much smaller number of others. And they're basically, uh, it's, a, it's an internal counterinsurgency program against the uh, uh, black, the poor, who happen, uh, poor in the United States is highly correlated with race. So it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's basically a counterinsurgency campaign against the uh, black and Latino population. Tell me one thing. We, we are in a country in Cuba today in which the hostility of the United States governments have been lasting for over four decades. What are we supposed to expect from this imperial grand strategy, not only in Cuba, but in Latin America? What is Latin America roles in that imperial grand strategy? Well, again, you know, the Bush administration is at an extreme end of a spectrum, which is not very broad. In fact, in the case of Cuba, it's extremely narrow. I mean, remember, it was the Kennedy administration, the opposite extreme of the spectrum, that carried out the large-scale terrorist atrocities in Cuba. Operation Mongoose under Kennedy was a major terrorist war. After the Bay of Pigs, first of all, they tried an invasion. When that failed, uh, came a terrorist campaign uh, right out of the White House, uh, run by Robert Kennedy, the president's brother, and it was very serious. I mean, it was, uh, you know, sinking fishing boats, uh, poison crops, uh, attacking uh, hotels and killing people, blowing up uh, petrochemical installations. I mean, it was not a joke. I mean, then it went on later, you know, shooting down airliners, all sorts of things. Uh, but uh, uh, most of it was in the Kennedy administration. It almost led to a nuclear war. It was a major factor behind the missile crisis, which came very close to a terminal nuclear war, very close. Uh, uh, and right, right, just to illustrate how the spectrum, right after the missile crisis, you know, it had finally settled down, didn't destroy the world, barely. Uh, the uh, Kennedy immediately escalated the terrorist campaign again, uh, included assassination attempts, but that was only a part of it. Uh, right after that, um, the, a leading elder statesman, Dean Acheson, Democratic, senior statesman who was an advisor to the Kennedy administration uh, gave a speech to the American Association, uh, American Society for International Law. This is January 1963, uh, in which he instructed the international law, law profession that, as he put it, uh, no legal issue arises in the case of a U.S. response to a challenge to its position, prestige, or authority. So no threat, just a challenge to our position and power. He was referring to Cuba. In that case, no matter what we do, no legal issue arises. And that's the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, and it continues to the present. Uh, the, uh, and of course, the US protects terrorists. I mean, you know, the FBI, regards Orlando Bosch as a leading terrorist. I think they accuse him of, uh, I think, 30 terrorist acts. Uh, President Bush number one gave him a presidential pardon over the strong objections of the U.S. Justice Department, who said this is a threat to the security of the United States. But it doesn't matter. We protect terrorists as long as they attack Cuba. Now, wh wh what happens to Cuba now? Well, part of the consequence of the surprising failure in Iraq, which did lead them, as you say, to go to the UN sort of hat in hand and say, help us out, 
uh, part of it is the need to create some other crisis. I mean, they have failed in their so-called war on terror, which is mostly fraud. They have dramatically failed to achieve objectives that you can boast about. You know, haven't caught Osama bin Laden, terror is increasing. Uh, the effect of the Iraq war was to increase terror exactly as was predicted. They have to do something. So what they have to do is have a victory somewhere. And it has to be a cheap victory. You know, you don't want to get involved with anybody who can resist. Uh, so immediately, uh, uh, almost immediately, same time they went to the UN, uh, Cuba was raised to the second rank of uh, terror states, right below North Korea and Iran, on the grounds that it's uh, producing uh, chemical and biological weapons. Mm -hmm. Do you need evidence? No. What's evidence? No. Uh, you just repeat it often enough, becomes a truth, it gets repeated by the media. Uh, that's one consequence. But I think there's something much more interesting and far-reaching happening. And that's illustrated pretty dramatically in Brazil. Uh, Brazil has been called for a century the Colossus of the South. It's a country that has the capacity to be rich and powerful, a lot of resources. It could be a counterpart to the Colossus of the North. Of course, it's never achieved that result for various reasons. Uh, Forty years ago, under the Kennedy administration, Brazil had a mildly populist president with some degree of popular support, Goulart. Nothing like Lula, but uh, moderately populist. Well, the Kennedy administration organized a military coup to overthrow him. That was the first and most important after Argentina of the major military coups that swept the continent, all Chile getting to all South, uh, Central America and so on. Uh, that was the first and most important because they would not tolerate a moderately populist leader with a degree of political support. Now, Lula just was voted in with massive popular support. That's a real triumph of democracy, you know, for popular organizations to uh, overcome a tremendous concentration of power and elect their own candidate. I mean, it's inconceivable in the United States and hard to imagine in Europe. But here's an amazing triumph of democracy. There's no call for a military coup. Well, why? Uh, it's much more threatening the U.S. interests than Goulart. Uh, the reason is, first of all, the populations wouldn't accept it anymore. They've changed since the 1960s. But this is institutionally required. You know. So first of all, they're pathological persons by law and institution with the power of the state behind them. And they're unaccount almost unaccountable to the public except by weak regulatory mechanisms which are being dismantled. Uh, if they can take over, and of course they're all integrated and tied to the few big states and so on. It's not a, nothing remotely like a free market. If you can take the entire, almost the entire public arena and hand it over to them, uh, democracy isn't a problem any longer. You know, people can vote and it uh, like, becomes like the UN, a debating society. You know. uh, that's a, a, a major difference. And that's been going on for 20 or 30 years. Again, these people are extreme, but not off the spectrum. So you don't have to have military coups. Uh, 